Okay, welcome back to Social Studies. I believe we are on Chapter 10, 11. Lesson 1, um, we are on page 287, the Colonial Government. Laws affecting each colony were made by colonial assemblies. In the New England colonies, the town meeting was the earliest form of self-government. The town meeting was a group of male colonists who got together to solve local problems. Have you noticed the theme? People that get to vote are males. People that are solving problems are males. Hmm. Yeah, and it's male, most of it's male landowners, right? And we talked about owning land and only one of us would have gotten a vote if they were male and they were male. All right. Um, the town meeting was a group of male colonists who got together to solve local problems. In other colonies, men created written plans for government. These plans spelled out important rights that the colonists would have. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, our rights, we have a Bill of Rights. That's a big deal. That was a super big whoopee for um, our nation was Bill of Rights. What, what rights do we have? That's a big deal. Um, the chart on this page lists some of these plans for government in the colonies. And we read, the, we read through those yesterday or last week, right? Royal governors. Eight of the 13 colonies were ruled by ro royal governors. A royal governor was not elected by the colonists. Instead, he was chosen by the King of England. Royal governors saw that the colonies obeyed British laws. Sometimes the governor and the assembly disagreed on which laws had to be obeyed. If the governor found the assembly unwilling to support him, he could dissolve or shut down the assembly. So let's talk about this for a brief second. I could, so the King of England, and we said he was like six weeks away by ship, right? Said, oh, this person you get to go be a governor. This person you get to go be governor over this state. Oh, you can be a governor over this state. And then what happened was this. If, I, if the governor disagreed with the lawmakers of that state, the governor had the right to say, sorry, you no longer get a vote. I get a vote. And he would say, you no longer help me make the laws. I'll pick some other people to help me make the laws. So in essence, the governor was kind of like a king. The only person that could fire him was the king of England, right? It'd be kind of like, um, kind of works, it kind of doesn't. It's kind of like, I'm hired, right? My job is to teach you guys. I can kind of rule like a king kind of in here, right? I'm under Mr. Palmer's authority, right? So Mr. Palmer could come in and change the things that I'm doing. Mr. Nutsley could come in and change the things I'm doing. Or the um, school, board. school board could come in and possibly change the things that I'm doing. But you guys have a vote but don't really have a vote. And if I don't really like the way you're voting, you get no vote. But the people that love you have a vote, right? So in that way, it's a little bit different because your moms or dads can make decisions or can say, oh, sorry, Ms. Richardson, we don't like this. And then we have conversations about it, right? But you as a kid don't, don't really have a ton of vote, like a, a, a vote, unless I give you a vote, which I usually do, right? Um, assembly members could, in return, refuse to vote for money for the governor's plans. Uh-oh. 
says, let us keep the dogs poor and we'll make them do what we please. One New Jersey assembly member said of the governors, the royal governors did not always have the same view as the assembly members. So the governor might want to do something, but because I was disagreeing with, because, so it's like if I'm the governor and you're the people, right? You're my people helping me make decisions. If I disagree with the choices that you guys are making, I can make your lives pretty miserable, right? But let's say I need money for something. You could say, no, sorry, Ms. Richardson, we're not going to vote for you to get money for new laptops, or we're not going to vote for money for this, or we're not going to vote for money for that. So even though I think this is what should happen, you guys can kind of stop me by not giving me the money. Now, do you think the governors are going to pay for things out of their own pocket? Probably not. So probably you not giving money for to the governors is probably just going to make everybody miserable, right? Well, the thing of it is the only way for me to take money from your taxes or me as a governor to levy more taxes is the governing body has to agree to it. So if they don't agree to it, I don't get more money to do things with. So it's kind of like we have a millage renewal coming up. We have a millage renewal coming up and it's for CTE. Do you guys know what CTE is? So, um, if you are like interested in a daycare, you guys can go to like Mount Pleasant and take a CTE class and, and practice doing daycare at a Mount Pleasant CTE class. Or um, my sister, I don't know if they still do it, but they had a baking class, like a bakery or something they ran up there in Mount Pleasant. And she went up every, she went up for a few years and took a class in Mount Pleasant for baking. Um, well, yep, so an R22, my friend's son. Uh, there is the Constitution of the United States. Now, what I was saying about CT, so we have we have a renewal proposal. So it's not that we we I think it's Gratia and Isabella both support the CTE program in Mount Pleasant. We are not asking for more money. We're just asking for it to be renewed. So it's already they've already taken however much money of your tax money, or they've already like established. Oh, we're going to support CTE with this amount of money. So all they're asking is. We're not asking for more money, we just want to keep the same amount of money coming. Does that make sense? Um, all right, turn the page. The Virginia House of Burgesses. In 1624, we didn't see, we haven't seen any of these people yet, have we? King George III, Patrick Henry, Paul Revere, George Washington. Nope, I don't think we've seen any of these yet. Okay, just check him. Keep an eyeball out for him. Oops, I just almost smushed my boycott. All right, the Virginia House of Burgesses. In 1624, King James of Britain had made Virginia a royal colony and appointed a royal governor to rule the colony. Whoops. The House of Burgesses still had some power. It could, for example, decide whether to divide large co counties into smaller ones. It could also make laws about the sale of tobacco. By the middle of the 1700s, the colonial Burgesses had gained much valuable experience in self-government. Okay, so we might add some stuff to them. Thank you. All right, so the talented Burgesses. On Spring Day 1769, Thomas Jefferson, he's not one of them on there, Thomas Jefferson traveled to Williamsburg, Virginia's capital. 
Only 26 years old, the young planter and lawyer had just been elected Burgess. Jefferson judged the House of Burgesses to be the most dignified body of men ever assembled to make laws. Most of the Burgesses were wealthy planters. George Washington and Richard Henry Lee served as Burgesses. They felt it was their duty to help govern the colony. So we have wealthy planters, George Washington. So now we know George Washington was a wealthy planter. Richard Henry Lee and now Thomas Jefferson. Um, but sometimes the assembly could try their patience. Lee, so Richard Henry Lee, who served from 1758 to 1776 admitted to his brother his disappointment about not getting much work done. I find the attendance on the assembly so expensive and the power of doing good so rarely occurring that I am determined to quit. Many Burgesses also tired of the many procedures connected to government. Formal ceremonies took up most of Jefferson's first day in office. So it says members of Virginia House of Burgesses met in this room, left in the 1700s. They wore wigs while they were there. So these are some of their wigs. So they, they met here and they wore these wigs. So these are some of their wigs they wore. Those are wigs, yep. So... Obviously, your head would go in here, and then it would make your hair white. Head would go in here and make your hair white. I don't know about this. I kind of wonder if this is the back. Oh, yep, that's the front. That's the back of it, right? This is the front. This is the back of that one. Can you imagine being a, you know, being a, a member of something like that, and you had to wear a white wig? Older and wiser, older and more dignified. Let's think about this. Do most actors or actresses, do they let their white hair show or do they dye their hair? So right now we value people that are youthful looking and not people that look older. And in this day and age, they had people looking older because they valued wisdom more. Yes. So yes. Yeah, so he had to wear one. He had to wear a wig. I don't know that it was those were his wigs, but he had to wear a wig in order to be part of um, the House of Burgesses. The House of Burgesses did make some important laws for the colony. The Burgesses had the power to print money, call for taxes build roads, and make land laws. They also had the power to prepare for war and raise money to support the colony's militia. A colonial militia was a military force made up of volunteers. The militia was similar to today's National Guard, which is made up of citizen soldiers. So they had the power to prepare for war, raise money to support the militia, print money, call for taxes, build roads, and make land laws. That, that's pretty important people, right? Yeah. yeah. A model for the colonies. By 1760, Virginia's assembly was the model for the colonial government. Every colony had elected an assembly like the House of Burgesses. To be elected, a delegate or a member of the assembly had to meet several requirements. A delegate had to be a, an adult white male. So let's do this. If not an adult, but stand up if you are a white male. Okay. 
In most colonies, he also had to own a certain amount of land. So, and it says, and file the Protestant faith. So, sit down if you don't file the Protestant faith. Protestant, um, hang on. Then it says, a delegate had to be a, a white male. In most colonies, he also had to own a certain amount of land and follow the Protestant faith. So if you don't follow the Protestant faith, you sat down. If you don't own a certain amount of land, sit down. <laughs> well, but he doesn't follow, he doesn't, so, so we've eliminated it successfully. Now let's just be honest. Were any of our white males adults? No, but I wanted you to see what happens. So nobody is eligible for the House of Burgesses. Can we do it? Can we do it again? What? Can we do it again like everybody? Yeah. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. Well, so then it says, thus in many colonies, women, African Americans, Catholic, Jews, and Native Americans could not be elected. So that's kind of crummy, right? If you're, you know, okay, so boys, boys can make some really great decisions, right? But can, that was not what I said, but can boys always accurately represent a woman's opinion? No. You. Okay, agreed. Now, not even all women make good decisions, okay? So, not everybody always makes good decisions. But, but I think the thing of it is, is that they're not. So, to be elected, you had to own land. Follow the Protestant faith, so it's only one kind of religion. Um, if you are women, African Americans, Catholics, Jews, and Native Americans, you're not elected. So, so I don't know that that's a really good uh, that's a really good representation of everybody, is it? Because they're not representing African Americans, they're not representing women. They don't have to worry about representing Catholics, Jews, or Native Americans. Indians were Native American. So they're not representing Native Americans. Most of the delegates were wealthy merchants or, or lawyers. Raise your hand if you would consider yourself wealthy. Rich. Okay. So, but, but I mean, you know, so I have, so I have two people, I have two people that said, yep, yep, I would consider myself wealthy. So, but that's two people out of 28 people, right? Do you think wealthy, do you think wealthy people always represents your best interest? Hmm. All right, um. Wealthy merchants, merchants were sellers or lawyers. In 1770, a lawyer named John Adams was elected to the Massachusetts Assembly. Benjamin Franklin was pleased to serve in the Pennsylvania Assembly. Franklin wrote that he was flattered. So if you are serving your people, should you be flattered because they elected you? Yeah. Yeah. Early colonial elections, elections in the 1600s and 1700s were noisy social occasions. An election causes a hubbub for a week or so, wrote one Virginia colonist. Do our elections cause hubbub for a week? Well, let's talk about how long do presidential elections last? They start talking about what, who, who they want on their ticket long before they actually elect them, right? 
And then you have to watch all those stupid ads on TV about vote for this person. What? Yep, and if you don't want to watch it, you don't watch it, right? But they but they buy buy airtime and then they talk about it. And they talk about it for months or years in advance, right? Because typically it costs us a couple years to earn the or for them to raise the money to run for election. Okay. Um he explained that Virginians used to dull barbecues and yet duller dances an election was quite an event on election day men from all over the county gathered at the courthouse or the village common remember you guys remember the village common right yes. it was the center section that was green voters looked forward to the punch cookies and cakes given out by the candidates free food everybody likes free food right George Washington provided similar drink, food and drink during his first election to the Virginia House of Burgesses in 1758. So let's talk about it. You would have to be wealthy to be able to provide punch, cake, and cookies for everybody, wouldn't you? Probably, because it would be super expensive if you provided punch, cake, and cookies for everyone, right? Um... Unlike today's secret voting, each voter spoke his choice in front of a large crowd. Loud cheers or boos followed each vote. The candidates often personally thanked a voter for his vote. Oh, that would be awkward, wouldn't it? Having to go to a public forum and say who you're voting for out loud? Well, especially if nobody likes your choice, they might boo you. Ugh. No, usually once you cast it, you cast it. You only get one vote. So this is a picture of Thomas Jefferson on the left. It was painted by the artist C.W. Peel. Richard Henry Lee, this is Richard Henry Lee below, was also a strong supporter of the colony's rights. Okay. Establishing freedoms. In their assemblies, colonial delegates spoke up for the freedom to rule themselves. The growing spirit of freedom also influenced the press or news publications in the colonies. John Peter Zinger. In 1733, a few members of the New York Assembly started a newspaper called the New York Weekly Journal. They hired John Peter Zinger, a German immigrant, as its printer. Zinger printed stories that criticized New York's royal governor. Royal governor meaning he was appointed by the king. William Cosby. One story in the newspaper accused Cosby of being dishonest. In 1734, the New York sheriff who supported the governor burned copies of the paper and put Zinger in jail. The governor accused Zinger of publishing remarks attacking the government. A lawyer named Andrew Hamilton defended Zinger at his trial in 1735. He argued that Zinger could not be punished for printing stories that were true. Okay, what? Say that say it more. What 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 are you what are you referring to, honey? <sighs> Copyright's a little bit different. So when when you're talking a paper, printing paper, you call it making copy when you write the article up with um, the words. And then you print, which is making a copy of the paper, you would print it, and then you would hand it out or, or distribute it. What is and do they have to We 
give me a minute. Let me see if I can come up with another thing to say. We'll, we'll look it up in a minute. I'm not going to look it up right this particular second, but we will look it up in a minute, okay? Um, let me let me keep reading, then I'll then I'll cycle back to it, okay? okay. Um, a lawyer named An Andrew Hamilton defended Zinger at his trial in 1735. He argued that Zinger could not be punished for printing stories that were true, even if they were about the governor. Everyone, every person had a right, Hamilton said, publicly to, pu publicly to oppose the abuses of power of men in authority. The jury agreed with Hamilton and found Zinger not guilty. Zinger's victory helped establish an important right, freedom of speech. This right meant that the colonists could speak or print the truth without fear of being put in jail. Um, trying to think of a truth. Um, trying to think of a truth. Hang on. So, a truth that we could print about Mr. Palmer is Mr. Palmer owes us how many? Two, two. two things for stungs. We've got 10, we've got over 20 stungs. He owes us two, right? Almost. We're working on our third, we're not to our third yet. So as a, so if my job was being a newspaper person, I could say, Mr. Palmer owes Miss Richardson's class two free recesses. That's the truth. Or two free something for their stungs. That's the truth, right? Well, the he owes us two things, right? Is that the truth? That's the truth, right? Now, if, the, if we make a class newspaper and that newspaper goes home to moms and dads, how good does it make Mr. Palmer look that he owes us two free, possibly not great, right? But he, is great. he is great, but it doesn't necessarily make him look great. Agreed? Yeah. So Mr. Palmer might say, well, Miss Richardson, I don't appreciate that you guys published this in your newspaper. You need to say it's not true. Or he might come down and, hypothetically speaking, what was happening was, I published it in my newspaper. One of my students wrote it. I published it in our school newspaper. And he might say, he, so it was like the guy came, took the papers. Mr. Palmer would take the papers, burn the papers, and he arrested me. So this lawyer says, Miss Richardson... Miss Richardson has a right to print the truth. You don't have to like the truth, but, I, but she has a right to print the truth. Her students have a right to write the articles that say, yes, indeedy, you owe them two free recesses. And so Miss Richardson and Miss Richardson's friends have every right to publish that and say, Mr. Palmer hasn't paid off for our free recesses yet. Now, are we going to ever publish that in a newspaper? No. And Mr. Palmer's a great guy, even though he hasn't got us our free recesses yet, right? It's because he has other things to do, and he's still doing his job. But it would be like we published an article. Mr. Palmer got grumpy about it. Mr. Palmer called the police and had Ms. Richardson arrested and put in jail for it. Well, right now we don't see it as any reason, but what the lawyer said was every person has a right to publicly oppose the abuses of power of men in authority. So I could say, Mr. or one of our friends could say, Mr. Palmer should have what? He should have given us our free recess by now, but he hasn't. And so we have every right to say that. 
And Mr. Palmer has no right to arrest Ms. Richardson for or her classmates for publishing it because we were telling the truth. What if I post it? Now, this was the truth. So the jury says, yep, Ms. Richardson's right. Ms. Richardson's lawyer's right. Ms. Richardson is not guilty. So one of the important rights we established was the freedom of speech. That's a big deal for our, for our country, freedom of speech. I have the right to say what I want to say. Now, do I have the right to make a threat? No, no but I have a right to say, I don't agree with that, Mr. Palmer. Make or if I make a threat, then my freedom of speech is, like, it doesn't apply to threats. Freedom of speech doesn't apply to threats. But I have a right to say I disagree with you. You have a right to say you disagree with me, right? You have the right to say it. But a lot of it times, it's the way we say it and the how we say it, right? So now we have African Americans speaking out. Enslaved African Americans took special note of the growing calls for freedom. Alone and in groups, they had long fought to be free from slavery. One African American who wrote of liberty was Phyllis Wheatley. She was born, and I believe this is Phyllis Wheatley. Yeah, this, this picture is a picture of Phyllis Wheatley right here. Okay, so it says of Phyllis Wheatley. She was born in what is now the country of Senegal in West Africa. She was kidnapped and brought to the colonies at the age of eight. How old are you guys? 11. 10 or 11. So two years ago or three years ago, you would have been in second grade? Third grade? Were you were you eight in second or third grade? I was nine. 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 So second or third grade. So she was kidnapped when you would have been in second or third grade at eight years old. She uh, was then sold, Wheatley was then sold as a slave to John Wheatley in Boston. It was common for enslaved people to be given the last name of their owner. So if Miss Richardson had a slave, my slave's last name would be Richardson, right? If Mr. Palmer had a slave, his, his slave would be Palmer, okay? Um, Mr. and Mrs. Wheatley taught young Phyllis to read and write English. Was that okay in the South? No. In 1773, she published a book of poetry while she was still enslaved. Wheatley urged the colonists to free their slaves. In every human, God has implanted a principle, which we call love of freedom, she wrote. The same principle lives in us. Why it matters, since the earliest beginning of the 13 colonies practice some form of self-government. Far from the King of England, the colonists formed town meetings and assemblies and created laws to govern themselves. These laws show the colonists' desire to be free to live as they choose. These strong beliefs in freedom and self-government would later shape the new government of the United States. The power of poetry is here. Why are Phyllis Wheatley's poems remembered today? Who knows of a poem or some kind of writing from 1776 other than the Declaration of Independence? Was that about from 1776? No. no. So most of the things that was written about in 1776, do we have any clue today? Uh -uh. No. Nope. Unless we looked up poetry in 1776. Why are Phyllis Wheatley's poems remembered today? People who are not free to do or say what they want sometimes write down their feelings to make them known. 
Phyllis Wheatley was enslaved, and she could not vote. She used poetry to express her opinions about slavery. Find a poem at home or in your library that you think has a message. Share poems aloud in class and talk about their meaning. I don't know. Let me think about it. Revi reviewing facts and ideas. The main idea is the early colonial assemblies helped to establish self-government in the 13 colonies. Assemblies such as the House of Burgesses made laws to print money, collect taxes, build roads, make land laws, and organize colonial militias. John Peter Zenger's trial in 1735 won support for the right to freedom of speech in the colonies. So we talked about this is Phyllis Wheatley. Down below is um, Zenger's trial was estab established freedom of speech. It was packed. This is the trial of John Peter Zinger for liberal libel resulting in the victory for free press, August 4, 1735. Can you wait till we're done? Yeah. Perfect. All right, the 13 colonies rebel. Focus activity. We're going to read to learn. What led the colonies to rebel against Great Britain? So look at this cool picture. Isn't that a cool picture? Vocabulary, libel, li liberty, rebel, stamp act, treason, sons of liberty, repel, repeal, town, se town sen act, boycott, committee of correspondence, Boston Tea Party, intolerable acts, people as Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, Mercy Otis Warren, Crispus, Crispus Atticus, and Abigail Adams. The 13 Colonies Rebel. Hanging from the Liberty Tree, a tall elm in the center of Boston, was a straw puppet of a British tax collector. The colonists were furious about a new tax the British government wanted them to pay. This disagreement was only one of the many conflicts between Britain and the 13 colonies that began after the French and Indian War. So hanging from a tree is a straw puppet. So there's a puppet hanging from a tree, and the puppet is a picture of the British tax collector. What do you think? If it's hanging from a tree, is it hanging like, woo, look at that cute little puppet? No. Or do you think they probably put a rope around its neck where his neck would be so it looks like they're trying to kill him? Yeah. It's probably a rope around his neck. And what message would it send to you if you saw uh, something that looked like you hanging from a tree? Would you feel warm and fuzzy? No. Or would you feel fear really afraid? Really afraid. Really afraid. The big picture, what is liberty? The word liberty means freedom. Do we have liberty on ours? No, we have sons of liberty, all right? What is liberty? The word liberty means freedom. To colonists, liberty came to mean freedom to govern themselves. I actually found liberty in the vocabulary section. In our vocabulary section? Well, where, where did it? Oh, you found it in the gloss. Okay. Yep. Okay, gotcha. As you read in Chapter 10, the British government did not allow colonists to move on to land west of the Appalachian Mountains after the French and Indian War. This angered some colonists. A new tax angered them even more. So think about, oh, I know, what would be the perfect tax to give you guys? No, it's even more brilliant. I should put a huge tax on gaming systems. I could just say the tax is half of the cost. So, so if so if your gaming system, what does your gaming system generally run? PlayStation. 
PlayStation is how much money? Like $400. So if it's $300, then your PlayStation will now cost $450, and I, the government, get $150 every time you buy a PlayStation. How much is an Xbox? So if an Xbox is 200 an Xbox? So if an Xbox is 300 also, then I would get another $150 from the Xbox. I'm in the money. Doot, doot. I'm in the money. Doot, doot. What? That would make me cry. But, but I mean, you get the idea, right? If I start talking, like, gaming, gaming systems, you're like, wait, whoa, what? That's a lot of money, right? What? Yep. Well, and I think, I think therein is the issue. Now, was the tax that high? No. In Michigan, we have six cents sales tax, six percent sales tax. Um, in Tennessee, they have food tax. The only time we pay taxes on food is when we buy um, fast food food or pre-cooked food. So, like, if you go get Chinese of the Great Wall in Alma, you have to pay tax. You have to pay taxes on it. If you get food from McDonald's because it's prepared food, you have to pay taxes on that. If I buy, if I go buy strawberries from Meyer or somewhere, I don't have to pay taxes on the strawberries. If I buy a carton of strawberries, I don't have to pay taxes on them. I pay whatever the price says, and then I walk out the door. No taxes on food, unless it's prepared food. Mm-hmm. There was about a $25 to $26 tax. Mm-hmm. So, me and my mom agreed that I would pay for the 300 and my mom would pay for the tax. Oh, that's a nice mom. So, yeah, and I think, I mean, the, the hard thing is to remember there is a tax on stuff, right? So, you have to plan more money than you're expecting to pay. I don't think so, but I'm not positive. I don't think so, though. I think it's like food that you can eat right away kind of thing. So, like, that is a good question, Slip. What? All right, so, um, so, um, the British government was deeply in debt, and they needed to pay for the royal governors and British troops it had sent to North America. The colonists angrily told British, the British that Parliament had no right to tax them without the vote of delegates in their own assemblies. Cries of taxation without representation as tyranny filled the streets. Tyranny is the cruel and unfair use of force or power. So it'd basically be like, I charge you guys tax for your gaming systems. Or it could be, shh, it could be I charge you tax for some of the things that you need to use in the classroom. I, no, seriously, no. I Do I do that? No. But, but yeah, I mean, I could charge you a tax for the pencils or I could charge you a tax for the thing. And well, granted, I'm not going to do that, my little fellow friend, but, but.
But yeah, they could have taxed a lot of different things. So this is what it says. The cat, um, so they're mad because Britain was made, Britain's the one who chose to send them. Britain's the one who chose to have British governors, right? Royal governors, and now they're saying, sorry, guys, you have to pay for your own governors. Does that sound fair to you? No. So it says, these and other conflicts would lead to the 13 colon lead the 13 colonies to rebel against British government. To rebel is to refuse to obey those in charge because of different ideas about what is right. Like in Sophia's war. Yeah, like in Sophia's war when she rebelled or her brother rebelled against them they there are consequences, right? They refuse to obey those in charge. That book, right? Sophia's yeah. War? I like it. They seem to like it. Mm -hmm. I've never even read well, I have two reading groups okay. that read while some of our friends are gone. So much like you guys read in your re you read down there, we're reading in here. Does that make sense? All right, here we go. England tightens its grip. After the French and Indian War, the British found out that governing and defending its new larger empire was difficult. Taxing the colonists seemed like an easy solution to one problem. The Stamp Act of 1765 was one of the first British laws placing taxes on the colonies. The colonists had to pay a tax every time they bought a newspaper or pamphlet or signed a legal document. These items had to have a stamp on them to show that the tax had been paid. In Virginia, a burgesses from the back country named Patrick Henry spoke to the assembly. He said that anyone who paid the stamp tax was an enemy of Virginia. Another Burgesses accused Henry of treason. Treason is the betrayal of one's country by giving help to one of its enemies. If this be treason, Henry replied, make the most of it. Henry's speeches against the Stamp Act were later published in colonial newspapers. His words inspired many colonists to protest against the Stamp Act. So let's look at this. So we have the Stamp Act. And what did we learn about the Stamp Act? Well, we're not going to say it's kind of ridiculous because we're defining it. What can we say about it? So it was 1765. And it placed what? The Stamp Act of 1765 was one of the first British laws placing. So 1765 placed taxes on the colonies. And they had to pay a tax. So this was a tax on newspapers. Pamphlets or legal documents. Sorry, thank you. Well, this, this stamp was proof that you paid your taxes. The stamp was proof you paid your taxes. Tax on newspapers, pamphlets. Mm. 
Like, have you ever gone to, like, the Michigan Welcome Center or uh, uh, you've ever gone to the Michigan Welcome Center or a rest stop or something? And they have those little three folded things there and you can pick them up and it tells you about tourist things or those are pamphlets. Usually in, in like rest stops or stuff like that, you don't have to pay for the pamphlets. Now, it depends on what kind of pamphlet you're getting. Like, used to be you could go into like Big Boy and they'd have pamphlets on the walls you could pick up. Or, um, well, I'm trying to think. But like rest stops or whatever, a lot of times they'll have pamphlets on the walls. And it's advertising like, oh, you should take Starline Ferry which is now, I guess, Mackinac Island Ferry, they've renamed. Or you could, um, oh, go see Pictured Rock. So if you go to a state park, they might have pamphlets there. You can pick up a pamphlet of tourist things in the area. Those are pamphlets. I haven't been to Pictured Rocks in a while, so I don't know. So 1965, uh, placed taxes on, on the colonies. There were tax on newspapers, pamphlets, and legal documents. 1765. I said the wrong one? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And legal documents. That's fine. If you don't have enough room, that's fine. All right, that's all she wrote. We'll chat with you later. Bye.